Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Anna Blanco and I'm the executive director of the International Ocean Film Festival. And it's my pleasure and my honor to have you join us here today. And it's my pleasure to be our moderator for today's discussion on the film, Diving Deep, The Life and Times of Mike Degree. Uh, we are live and um, we do have an audience joining us this afternoon. So um, if you have any questions, please be sure to send them in and also let us know where you're chiming in from. Part of the beauty of being able to do this in person there in, on, um, and virtually is just to be able to connect with so many people around the world. So to those of you who are out there, thank you for joining us. Um, to those of you who are watching the recorded version, uh, we also thank you for watching the film and the recorded version of our conversation today. So thank you. Before we get started, I wanted to just say a few things about the Ocean Film Festival. This is our 17th year. And as much as most of you know, we were supposed to do this in person in March of 2020 at Cowell Theater here in San Francisco. And unfortunately due to the pandemic, we canceled a week before we were supposed to have our opening night, which in fact was going to be diving deep the life and times of Mike Degree. Wow. So uh, we're, we're here together now and that's what matters. Um, one of the nice things about hosting a virtual film festival is that we have an, a larger reach. We are able to reach um, people around the world, which is very exciting. Um, we have over 54 films and 14 Q and A's that we're doing similar to this. We're adding more as we go along. Um, so there's some great films and the beauty is it's like video on demand, 24 seven, you can have access to these films. And what we've learned over the last couple of weeks or so since we started on July 30th is that people are busy. Um, people are home and people are busy and um, they needed more time. So on Friday, we decided to extend it further and uh, the end date is now August 16th. So a whole nother week, a whole nother seven days to watch the films. So um, I hope you enjoy them. I hope you have a chance to um, see them. And what I like to say is that we're all connected by our oceans. And what we've learned during this pandemic is that it's even more important to stay connected. So doing this conversation today is another way of staying connected and watching the films is another way of staying connected. And by doing so, you're helping the Ocean Film Festival fulfill its mission, which is to save our oceans one film at a time, which is what we're doing here today. So thank you. Um, I'd also like to give a shout out to our sponsors. Our sponsors are who make the festival possible. Um, we also have about 40 volunteers who work on the film festival six to nine months prior to making it all happen. So um, I know a few of you are chiming in today as well. So thank you for your passion, your commitment and your dedication to making the film festival possible. I miss you all. Um, the format for today's conversation will be about 40 to 45 minutes of Q&A. Then we'll open up the questions to the audience. So um, please take advantage of this opportunity to ask your questions. So um, I wanna get started, but what I'd like to do and what I, I tend to do with conversations like this is to read our bios of our guest panelists. So um, everyone is so accomplished, but I like to shout out, um, you know, what they've done and just to, for anyone who's new to the ocean community, um, new to the film festival, just to give you a background on who we have here today and how fortunate we are. I'll start with you, Mimi. Uh, Mimi Armstrong Degree is a Santa Barbara based documentary filmmaker. Along with her late husband, Mike Degree, she has produced numerous hours of award winning television for National Geographic, the BBC, and other broadcasters. She earned a BA from Yale University and began her career with work on her work with CNN, Turner Broadcasting Series Portrait of America, and the PBS series The Infinite Voyage. She's a mother of two, and she believes wholeheartedly in the power of community and its ability to affect change. And she's an active volunteer with various nonprofit organizations. She's the director of Diving Deep, The Life and Times of Mike Degree, and she's joining us from the East Coast. Welcome, Mimi. Thank you. Thank you. We also have Paul Atkins, who is a cinematographer and Paul was um, Mike's early friend, and I believe your first, um, his first filmmaking partner. 
Paul has worked with directors such as Terrence Malick, Alejandro Gonzalez Iñarritu of The Revenant and McGilvery Freeman Films amongst others. He's worked on narratives, documentaries and commercials. He's the owner of Moana Productions and he lives in Hawaii. He's a friend of Mimi and Mike Degrees, um, that uh, a friendship that goes back to the uh, 80s and he is joining us from Hawaii. Welcome, Paul. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> And of course, we have Dr. Sylvia Earle. Thank you, Sylvia, for being with us. Sylvia is the president and chairman of Mission Blue, the Sylvia Earle Alliance. Um, she's a National Geographic Society explorer in residence. She's referred to as her deepness by the New Yorker and the New York Times. She's a living legend by the Library of Congress. She's the first woman to have been appointed chief scientist of the US National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. She's the first hero for the planets by Time Magazine, which is women who are changing the world. And I have my copy of my Time Magazine, Sylvia, right here. Um, she was also recognized as our 2019 Ocean Hero at the 2019 IOFF Off the Reef Gala last November, which was very exciting. And last but not least, Sylvia was my personal inspiration for becoming a scuba diver. When I met her, she was like, I, we talked so much about scuba diving and I was so impressed. And I said, you know, I'm not a diver yet. And she just looked at me point blank and said, well, what are you waiting for? You need to dive in. And I did, and no regrets ever since. So thank you for that, Sylvia. Thank you for joining us. Sylvia joins us from, uh, from here in the Bay Area. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Great to be on board. So this is a really special um, Q&A for me to be hosting today. Um, I had the honors of meeting uh, Mimi at the Jackson Wild Film Festival last September. And she showed Diving Deep, that was my first time seeing it. And she received a standing ovation after the screening. Um, as I said earlier, the film was scheduled to be our opening night film back in March. Um, it's also the winner of the 2020 Director's Award, so consider this my opportunity to give you your award, <laughs> Mimi, or you. congratulate you. Uh, we do have a, a beautiful a beautiful photograph of, um, of our big-eyed fish that has been our um, logo this year for the film festival, so we have a, an award for you that we will get to you. Um, and like all the other films um, that are in the virtual film festival, we have initiated a global audience choice award, which is all the films that we're showing virtually are eligible. So this film was also eligible as well. So if you're, if you haven't had a chance to see it, please do so. Um, so let's get started. And Mimi, I want to, I want to start with you. Um, if you could just tell us a little bit about, um, about the making of the film. Um, it's a beautiful film and I feel like I got to know Mike really, really well. Um, it's, it, I love the first six minutes of the introduction of the film. And I know this must've been an, an emotional project for you to undertake, um, seeing all the footage of Mike and interviewing so many people that were close to him. Um, can you share with us the challenges of working on something so personal? When were your emotions your guide to developing this work and when were they a challenge to overcome? Oh gosh, well, it was a challenge to make the film, but it also, I have to say, was a real gift. I mean, Mike died suddenly in an accident as anyone who's seen the film knows, or maybe <clears throat> you've just heard that. Um, and, you know, that's a really difficult place to be, obviously those that are left behind. And I had this gift of being able to go into the edit room, go through all of this footage and in a sense, be with him. Um, so from that standpoint, it was both really um, very meaningful. It was also very challenging because he wasn't there and yet there he was on the screen. And I think, you know, I realized that he left just as I felt he might've been doing his most important work, which was um, in the aftermath of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And so I really wanted to highlight what I didn't think or what I thought he wasn't able to say, but I, I also felt that for people to really feel the emotion that he felt with that spill 
um, they needed to understand who he was and where he came from and, and what the trajectory of his career had been. So it was hard. I mean, he had so much footage, so both on camera, but also behind the camera, incredible footage that he shot with Paul and Gracie, who we have to do a shout out to, Paul's wife, Gracie Atkins, amazing filmmaker. They were a team when I met them. Anyway, back to Mike. Um, so I think just trying to encapsulate his life and spirit so that people would come away with another um, lens through which they could see that deep water horizon oil spill and perhaps be moved, I'd hoped, to speak out um, against future drilling, the rollback of all of the um, restrictions that had been put in place, you know, endless. Anyway, just to be moved to um, be involved with the ocean and, and be moved by his spirit. So that was kind of my motivation. Mm -hmm. Well, you did it, you, you captured it beautifully and it's a fantastic film. I went back and watched it again and I think I could probably watch it um, several times. It's, it's, it's truly captivating. Thank you. Um, Sylvia, I wanted to ask you, um, I know that you're from New Jersey, um, but um, I, you also, like Mike, fell in love with the ocean when you lived on the Gulf Coast. Can you share with us what's so special about that area that enthralled you and Mike alike and fostered a sense of wonder for the ocean. And I will say for those of you who haven't seen the film, Mike was originally from Mobile, Alabama. And so the Gulf Coast was his backyard and that's how he fostered a love for the ocean. Tell us about your experience, Sylvia. Well, my parents moved to Florida when I was 12 and my backyard was the Gulf of Mexico. That's where I first breathed compressed air underwater. I had two words of instruction, breathe naturally. Oh, it worked, I mean, I'm still here. <laughs> but it was some years before there were actual classes available. I mean, you could be a Navy diver before, this was in the 1950s. So Patty and, and Naui are organizations that came later and, we learned by doing, and I think Mike similarly took the plunge before there were many rules and regulations, but he too survived and, and thrived. The Gulf of Mexico really is an extraordinary place, considering how much has been taken out of the Gulf in the last 50 years or so. The fishing, the this amazing growth of offshore oil wells. More than 30,000 have been drilled in the Gulf of Mexico. And it still has this amazing resilience. It's not what it used to be by any means. I went to school in Clearwater High School, in Clearwater, Florida, on the Gulf Coast of, of Florida. Clearwater had clear water. Oh, it doesn't anymore. <laughs> and that's true of a lot of places along the coast. In the area where Mike was a boy, the, the coastal area around Mobile, because of the rivers, often wasn't like the Bahamas exactly. <laughs> but once you got offshore, not very far offshore, that loop current that comes up from the Caribbean and swoops around in the Gulf of Mexico. And you see it along the coast at Panama City, a little bit further down uh, east of where Mike was a kid. It, it's magic. The water was clear. The beaches are, clear, are just the white sand beaches. You, it's hard to believe you're in North Florida. Well, Panama City today isn't what it used to be. We've done terrible things to the Gulf, thinking that somehow doesn't matter what you put in, doesn't matter what you take out. The Gulf, the ocean generally is too big to fail, except Mike was a witness. I've been a witness. Paul, you've been a witness, all of us, of this extraordinary time of learning more about the ocean than during all preceding history put together. As our technology advanced, and Mike not only loved to just dive, he, and I share this, loved submarines. 
<laughs> yeah. Oh my. And what you can do by going deeper and being able to stay longer. You know, as divers, we can see just the skin of the ocean down to 50 meters or so. But beyond that, we, we have to give it over to technology just as going high in the sky. And, and Mike embraced that. Uh, I embrace that. I mean, it's just use the tools that you have to understand what needs to be understood. And now we know we must, we must take care mm -hmm. of the ocean as if our lives depend on it, because they do. Mm -hmm. And that's so true. And that is so, so true. We're going to come back to the deep water horizon and, and, and Mike's passion for submarines. But I wanted to ask um, Paul first. Um, you knew Mike for many, many years, and um, I believe you knew him before he met Mimi. And yesterday we had a delightful conversation we were, when we were discussing how interesting it is when the universe brings us all back together. And you have a great story about filming with Mike um, in Hawaii. Can you tell us that story? Yes. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say I'm so sympathizing with what Sylvia was saying because I grew up in the Gulf Coast too. I grew up in Mobile, Alabama, oh. and um, and and I I learned the scuba dive. I was desperate to learn because I watched Jacques Cousteau, <laughs> and uh, I learned the scuba dive uh, at the YMCA by a Navy instructor. So I was really yeah. It was before safety. <laughs> So, and I never met Mike until, uh, strangely enough, my family knew his family, but we've never met. We were different ages slightly, and I met him in Hawaii. Hmm. Um, but the story you're referring to, Anna, is, um, and Mimi, uh, by this time, um, uh, Mimi and Mike and I and Gracie were making films together, um, and we were up in a remote area of the Hawaiian Islands called the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. A lot of people don't know about them, but uh, they're 1,500 miles up to the Northwest beyond the main islands like Maui, Kauai, and Oahu. There is, there's this chain of sand spits and atolls. They go all the way up to Curie Atoll. And it's extraordinary. There's only wildlife up there. And I was there uh, recently and I was reminiscing because I was at a place called French Brigade Shoals where Mike and Mimi and I had filmed um, years ago, uh, I mean, in the 90s, I guess it was. And you 80s, were filming late 80s, for, yeah. Or, or late 80s, was it late 80s? It was 89, I remember, because we got married uh, a month after we came back. <laughs> oh my God. Oh God. <laughs> Yay. And um, there's some images in the film from, the, from, from there, and, uh, and I was there recently. And I sailed on a, a ship called the uh, Makani Ulu, a, a, a hundred foot sailing boat. And as we were sailing up, they were telling me about another film that they had been on a Nat Geo film some years ago. And they said, well, you're staying in the Sylvia Earl cabin. <laughs> that was my cabin. And I was like, wow, Sylvia stayed there. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, just to the other uh, part of the story was, is I hadn't been there in years. And um, it had changed a lot, needless to say because a hurricane had, had wiped out one of the main islands, East Islands, where we used to film, but it is recovering. But before this trip and, and after uh, the trip with Mike and Mimi, I was on a Jean-Michel Cousteau expedition, mm. which resulted, we, 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 we stopped in, at all the islands. It's an extraordinary experience. We stopped at every single island up the chain all the way to Curie and the film that came out with is called Voyage to Curie. And Sylvia, you could pick up this story here because that film was taken by to Washington to the bushes by yes. Sylvia and Jean Michel. And Sylvia, amazingly, you can take over that story. What what exactly happened? <laughs> <laughs> well, the I think it was because of Laura, but whatever happened, the, the film was shown at the White House. There was a dinner, and I was one of the lucky ones who got invited. And I invited my friend Linda Glover to accompany me. And after the film, we were ushered into the room where there were tables where six people sat around the table. I mean, just six tables. There were, say, there were maybe 10 tables in all. And 
my friend was the first to sit down at the table and this guy came over and asked if he might join her and she kind of looked over and said oh yeah of course it was bush <laughs> president <Bush. laughs> which is probably how i got to sit at the table because um jean michel came over naturally took his place next to president bush and then the head of the marine sanctuary program and her husband took up the all together that was five and there's one seat remaining and i I took the seat because my friend was there, and it's only kind of belatedly that I realized that that's also where President Bush was sitting. I thought <laughs> somebody else should have be that in that spot. But as it turned out, we had an hour and a half of conversation that was just remarkable because, well, first of all, President Bush likes to go fishing. And it occurred to me to say, like, duh. Um, if there are to be fishermen, there have to be fish. And the way things are happening, fish are, are really experiencing hard times. 90% of many of the big fish are already taken. He did not know that. I mean, he had wars and economy and things to think about, I suppose. He did not know that 90% of the sharks were gone and that sharks are really important. And he also didn't know that fishing takes place in the sanctuaries. He said, well, why did they call them sanctuaries then? Oh. And around the table, and Jean-Michel was really on point, and so was the head of the sanctuary program and Linda Glover. I mean, we pounced on him in a way <laughs> about a, a quick update on why the ocean matters and why full protection is really important. It was destined to become a sanctuary, which is great, except that it isn't great. Fishing goes on, commercial fishing, sport fishing, takes place in our marine sanctuaries, and just a very small portion of most of them is actually set aside as a safe haven where no fishing takes place. And there's evidence that, and, and Mike understood this, you, you really have to get serious about protection if you want recovery to take place, or if you really want to have a safe haven, you, you just have to say, this is, that's what it's all about. You have to really, like a national park, you don't kill the birds, you don't shoot the animals, you don't, you know, it's really a sacred place. So anyway, when dinner was over and Bush sort of swept out of the room, he, he, he looked back, zeroed in on Jim Connaughton, who was head of the the group that executed on his orders, said, Jim, make it happen. We want the fullest, the biggest area, and we want it to be no take. So instead of it being a little bit of an ex uh, uh, area around the coast, the biggest area that was then proposed was like 50 miles. Well, the exclusive economic zone goes out 200 miles. Nonetheless, it was the biggest marine protected, biggest protected area on the planet at the time that Bush signed into law. And I got to be there. Oh, it was so cool. And <laughs> Jean Michel, and we, uh, mm. we th that film, that film was the catalyst. It really made all the difference. And, but for that, the Papua Makea Marine Reserve might not exist today. Yeah, that's yeah, it's, it's amazing, and and it does show. It is an example where a film can can make a difference. Of course, it needed the assist from you. Well, it was just you've got it. You got to get the right nudge. Way. You know, it's like <laughs> <little> interpretation. <laughs> and I know uh, you know that was so important uh, to, to Mike, um, as as um, in in because I was I worked with Mike so many years. And um, we were always conservation minded, but a lot of early part of our career um, was about capturing a part of the world which no one had ever captured before on film and bringing it to an audience, to expose an audience to places on the planet, especially on the ocean that they had never been before. That's right. And, and, um, and the idea was, is that would create a love of the ocean and you only want to protect things that you love. And I think that's still a philosophy, but as 
the crisis uh, for the oceans, for the climate, for the planet in general, got got more and more severe. I know that that Mike got more and more um, dedicated to actually not just telling stories about the natural world, but to fighting it, to getting a message across about directly what was being done to the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Mimi, you could follow up on that because I know you know you know how that passion took over him. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, I think Sylvia, um, too, that in the um, aftermath of the Deepwater Horizon spill, I think one of the things that was so motivating, albeit absolutely devastating to Mike, was that in talking to the scientists, so many people couldn't tell him what they thought would happen because there really was very little baseline data. And so he was just, he, he was astonished saying, I don't understand how we let these things happen while we drill without knowing what's there in the first place. So I think, and of course that included in a huge way, the deep sea. So I think his whole mission towards the end of his life was we got to explore, we've got to, you know, we've got to measure, we've got to just understand as well as we can what is there before it's lost altogether. So Yes, I think um, he was really motivated and, and it's, it's kind of interesting to speculate in some ways what he would be focusing on now, but I think mm -hmm. very much um, in sync with what Sylvia is doing and Paul, what you're doing and what everyone who's exploring the deep sea is doing. That's, I, he would be right there. I think Mike would be all over the deep sea mining issues. Absolutely, I agree. It's the biggest land grab on the planet right now yes. in the high seas in the deep sea and we're letting it, it, it and part of the reason it's happening is the same reason that offshore oil and uh, drilling took place in because nobody raised up and said but wait we don't know what's there we we but we know it's important but we should explore before we exploit it's just too important and, and as knowledge of the ocean increases and the we can see two things, how everything, our, our existence is really anchored to the nature of the ocean. If the ocean in trouble, we're in trouble. Whether it's climate, chemistry of the ocean, chemistry of the atmosphere, the diversity of life, all these things keep us alive. And the fact is the ocean is in a state of dramatic decline. The chemistry of the ocean is changing. It's not just acidification. It's it's a whole host of things because we're taking so much out and because we're putting so much stuff in. And then to even dare to take a wild area that is pristine, untouched except for the rain of junk that we throw into the ocean, the, the deep sea, what right do we have to tear into the deep sea for things we don't really need. Metals, minerals, there are alternatives. And maybe the time will come in the not too distant future when battery technology won't require cobalt and nickel and other ingredients that are now being used to justify going into the deep sea. So I think for Mike, it would just be the next thing that commanded his- Absolutely. You know, I was gonna. I was gonna go along with us uh, with that conversation. I think so much of every film we see about the deep sea and all of the species that haven't been discovered. It's it's just remarkable what lives in the deep sea. And I know in the film, there's so much about Mike wanting to get into the submarine and explore. Mm -hmm. How do we how do we encourage more investment in exploration. I mean, more people have been to the moon than they have to the bottom of the ocean, and there's so much to discover. How do we how do we encourage more investment in deep sea exploration? Doing, I think, just what you're doing. <laughs> get people inspired. Get people to be conscious, aware, of why it matters. And only a handful of people will be able to go to the moon or even into space as astronauts, but the wonderful thing about the ocean is it's right here. And we ought to encourage people to dive in, literally, <laughs> and, and take Mike as inspiration, take 
Paul and Gracie, take all of us as, you know, look, um, what are you, what are we waiting for? <laughs> and you, what are you waiting for? Die then. Yeah. yeah. What and, are we waiting for? You know, one of the things that I loved, one of the accomplishments of Mike was what he did with octopuses, cephalopods. He was a cephalopodaholic. <laughs> yeah, he was. And the deep sea is just rich with these weird and wondrous animals that are so in, so smart, so enchanting. And it pains me every time I see calamari on the menu or go and see octopus served on airlines or serving octopus. Like, wait a minute, you guys, you know, we've got to get the word out that this is, these are wild creatures. You wouldn't put songbirds on the menu on a flight from, from Frankfurt to to San Francisco. So why do you have octopus? It's just crazy. Anyway, um, very very insightful, and and uh, it's so interesting to see about. You're right, Sylvia. What you do find on the menu, and kind of how we're we're mistreating so many of our of our sea life. Um, one of the sequences that I love the most in the film is uh, the piece in Patagonia in 1990, Mimi. And um, where I think Mike talks about, you know, you take risk and when you take that risk, or maybe it's your narration um, about when you take risk, you it's an opportunity for self-discovery. And I really like that and it, and it really, um, resonated with me. And earlier today, we had a conversation with another wildlife photographer, uh, Amos Nahum, mm -hmm. who is a friend of the festival. And um, he, his film is called The Picture of His Life, where he takes a lot of risk in um, going underwater and taking amazing photographs of killer whales, um, white, great white sharks, um, polar bears is his most recent one. What do you think Mike would say now about the risk that he took back in 1990 to capture that footage of the killer whale eating the seal pups? What do you think he would say about that today? Because that was pretty risky and I loved it. But what do you think he would say? Well, I'm going to answer really quickly and then throw it to Paul because Paul and Mike shot that together. And I'm going to say two things. One is I think Mike had a little bit of a different amyg amygdala than many people. <laughs> I think he had a slightly, I was so fascinated. I think he did have a slightly higher threshold for risk. Um, having said that, I also witnessed him being a little bit afraid at times that surprised me. But the next thing I wanted to say is that Mike and Paul were a team. And I think, and Paul, you, you riff on this however you want, but my feeling was that the two of you really were so extraordinary in so many ways, but one of the ways was you encouraged each other to be better than you might have been by yourselves. I always felt that about Mike. I don't know if you felt that about Mike, but, and Mike and you, I felt that you were such, you guys are so complimentary. And so I think that sequence is a classic example, as are a number of others that you did, of just kind of pushing each other along. Now you, you said crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, that time we had in Patagonia was a, a, an amazing time for us. And uh, going back to the risk, um, you know, when we tell these stories about these things we do, they do seem crazy, like getting in the water with killer whales that are hunting mammals. And when, and I think Mike says this in the film, but when we first arrived in Patagonia, we talked to local divers and so on and everyone said oh my god no you would never get on the water with those killer whales and this was you know in the uh, uh late 80s early 90s not orca were not known that well really and um but we did watch them it wasn't like we said oh to heck with you we're gonna do it because we're you know, we're groundbreakers we took that to heart and we watched them very carefully we were there for almost six weeks we were there for about a, a five-week period and after watching them and filming them and looking at their behavior for four weeks, we had constant discussions at night about, well, do you think it's possible to get into the water with them? Do you think it's possible? Our scientific advisor was like, mm, no, I don't think so. But Mike and I uh, reasoned that they were very sophisticated animals. And they were using their echolocation to locate uh, sea lion pups. As Mike says in the film, they could be uh, a bunch of uh, sea lions, maybe one pup 
in the center and they could detect that from 50, 60 yards out with no visibility. So they're not going to suddenly mistake us for prey. It's just, it just seemed inconceivable. So, you know, and we had mental housings and everything. So, so uh, the, the last week we decided to get into the water with them. So it wasn't, um, it wasn't just daredevil insanity. It was pretty carefully considered. Mm -hmm. I, th I think that's a key to much of what makes your films, what makes Mike's films so special, that you, you think like the orca, you think like the octopus, mm -hmm. you get inside their skin and it, it really makes a difference. It's not, I mean, you're, you're, you're not quite human. <laughs> you're, you're, you, are the, you are the animal mm -hmm. and that, that truly is the, has to be the key to why you are so, you and, and Gracie have pulled it off time and again. And certainly I know for sure that was <laughs> the way with Mike. I think that's a really good point, Sylvia. And one that I think is something that people should think about today. I think Paul and Gracie and Sylvia, you certainly, and Mike, um, have this relationship to the natural world that's Empathy. very symbiotic and it's very it, it's, it's a real understanding and a wish to share that understanding um and i think one thing about paul and mike's early films too is that you guys were filming behavior long before people really were focusing on behavior so you're right i think they got into the animals heads and skin and <laughs> and were they showed that manna shrimp kicking the Yes. Here <laughs> or whatever it was. Um, and all mm -hmm. kinds of, in our shark film, like my shark film, we had, I don't even remember the number of behavioral sequences we had, but we spent year, three years oh. getting as many as we could so okay. that we, they weren't just passing shots of wildlife in the sea. And that was unusual. And, and it like, wasn't, it isn't that you humanize the animals, you are the animal. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. You, you treat them with dignity and respect. It, it's it's a very different perspective. It's not anthropomorphism. It's it's thinking like a fish. Yeah, it's, I would totally agree with you. Yeah, and and I, think, to yeah I, 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 I think we did. Uh, I think we did struggle uh, to do that. You know, and, and I mean, now that you're talking about it, I'm thinking about it. Yeah, Mike and I, it, we, we both kind of had that attitude that we wanted to uh, know things more from the uh, the animal's perspective. Right. And, and, and the more you watch animals carefully and spend some time with them, the more you realize they all have their different language, not maybe in the technical sense, they all have their, their different postures and ways of communicating. And once you tune into that and pay attention to that, it's just like Mike talking about the threat postures of sharks. I mean, he learned the hard way about <laughs> the, that, that, that body language of a shark. Mm -hmm. um, but, but once you start to tune into that, you know every animal has that. Even an amoeba has something you know, unique about its perspective. And um, yeah, and I think it becomes the fascinating thing. Yeah, for sure. The more you can make a film from an animal's perspective, the better. Of course, Mimi, you were referring to how much time you and Mike spent on those behavioral sequences with that shark film because every sequence was a different species of shark shot in a different place in the world right. it was amazing and uh, and but there's a there are different times now aren't there yeah. because yeah. we had more bigger budgets back then <laughs> to, to because the one thing about behavior is it's expensive you it's just have time. to spend a lot of time and mm -hmm. you, you know, know whereas I'm... you can take take some uh extreme adventurer out and film them getting in danger which is a very popular thing now and that's relatively inexpensive to film <laughs> Yeah. It's also a lie, you know. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, I was going to ask you about that, Paul. I mean, how much has it changed making films for some of the bigger production companies like Nat Geo and, um, you know, in Discovery? In fact, I think today, Shark Week starts today, I think, on the Discovery Channel. And mm -hmm. both you and, and Mike were host of, of Shark Week. How has that changed in terms of um, producing films for some of the major broadcasting organizations like that? Yeah, well, I was never a host on Shark Week, but Mike was for a while. And uh, it was interesting because, uh, you know, he was struggling with that 
because he wanted to get a positive message out about sharks. But a lot of times we all know Shark Week, especially in the early period, is very sensationalistic about its portrayal of sharks. It was always about jaws and death and danger and playing that crazy music. And so uh, Mike and I talked about that a lot because uh, he would sometimes be embarrassed by the way the shows were edited because he wasn't in control of that. But he, he pushed, he always pushed those producers to make it better, to make it more yeah. factual. And, and I've been, you know, I've been involved in some Shark Week shows and they are getting uh, more scientific. They're still quite sensational at times, but I did ha have to say, I did have a change of heart about Shark Week when I met some young people who, young shark researchers who are studying sharks. And it's like, how did you get involved in this? And they go, well, I grew up watching Shark Week. <laughs> and so it's like, okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's it it's doing its job. Yeah. Um, uh, what was the second part of that question? I think I just went off on a rift. No, I think I I think you answered it. Um, I can't remember okay. what the question was, but I think you answered it, and you kind of gave us oh just how different it's it is to you know. Yeah, kind of it is very different today. Yeah, yeah. because yeah. you know there was a time when Mike and Mimi and Gracie and I were getting started in, and Sylvia was uh, making films too when. You know, literally, National Geographic used to have four or five films a year that would come out as specials, sometimes on the networks, sometimes on PBS. And they didn't have the channel. And they, there weren't that many documentaries, especially about the ocean, produced. So each one was a special event. Right. And, and, uh, and they got big audience figures. So they put lots of money into making these things. You could spend easy two years uh, making an hour documentary. For National Geographic and others. And then as channels pl proliferated, you know, and became more and more, and they just need more and more programming, this insatiable appetite. And, and also the networks learned, as Sylvia was referring to, uh, and I was earlier, that you can do these things cheaper by just taking some adventurer type wild person and putting them in danger. Take a cheap video camera, you can film that very quickly. Boom, you've got a show in five days. Whereas it might have taken you six months to do a wildlife show. So, so yes, it has changed. Um, there are, having said that, today, uh, people like the BBC Natural History Unit. And um, there are uh, uh, companies that have spun off from the old BBC days run by uh, uh, people that used to produce programs like Planet Earth. And they're working with David Attenborough. And they are still holding that standard. Mm -hmm. So in American mm -hmm. broadcasting, it's gotten more difficult. Yeah. And their programs like Wicked Tuna, it, it's just, it's a wicked program. It, it's all about dead tuna and it's like a soap opera among the fishermen. It, it, to your point, there's very little about tuna except how, how great it is that they, you can make so much money killing them. And it's, it's really totally the wrong message. But, you know, it's a perversion of something that was and, heading in the right direction. And it's a sign of our times uh, uh, that, I don't want to name names, but the same network that might do uh, Wicked Tuna is also going to do a special on how uh, bluefin tuna are endangered. Right. Uh, so they're putting out <laughs> both things. Yes, mixed message. Mixed message. Exactly. 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 <laughs> Um, yeah. Mimi, I want to go. I want to come back for a minute to um, what is so for me, and, and I think for so many people who've watched the film, is just how impactful and how infectious Mike's spirit and enthusiasm is. I mean, I don't think I've ever met anybody who was so giddy and excited about the ocean, and and that's what I want people to really see. Is like you know, this person just just like. He just was enthusiastic and oozing love and fun and for the ocean. Um, and I think Sylvia, at some point in the film, you said something to the line along the lines of, "If only more people had his enthusiasm and sense of stewardship for the ocean, we'd be much further along in ocean conservation." Um, so Mike's a very powerful source of inspiration, and you created that with this film. Um, what would what do you think Mike would be wanting us to do better? for our oceans at this point? Gosh, where do you start, Sylvia? I think um, so much. 
But I think fundamentally, I think, I think what so upset him was our fundamental disconnect from the earth. And I think Mike was a very earthly person. I mean, he was very rooted in the earth, on the earth and there, one foot in the ocean. And I think he just felt viscerally the power of nature. Mm -hmm. um, almost to use a sort of cliche, I would say in a way, almost in a shamanic sense. I mean, he really felt very attuned to the natural world. And I think, I think many kids now are, are more aware of the natural world. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm hopeful, but I think he felt we had become so removed from the power of nature, the power of the ocean specifically. And I think, so if you go back to the root problem, I mean, I think in many ways that's it, you know, and if we all felt the power of it and the importance of it and understood the necessity to have a healthy ocean to our very, for our very existence, then you move outward from there and people make it a higher priority. Legislation obviously is the muscle that's gonna change things, um, but you have to have people feeling the power of it in order to enact that legislation. And I don't know, Sylvia, you can speak powerfully to all of this. Where you start and how you unravel the problems that exist is a difficult one to answer, I think. Well, Mike was a genius at sharing his sense of wonder. Mm -hmm. It came through with the films about octopus and squid, but in everything that, that he did. He, he genuinely felt that sense of awe, of wonder. Mm -hmm. And if we can convey that, that, that life is a miracle, and we're here for just a short period of time, and it's not all about us. We're a part of this great continuum. And Mike's influence during the time we, he was here was so powerful. He's still here. He's still making an impact, still influencing everyone who knew him and a lot of people who never knew him with that, that joy of existence and a desire to protect life. And it, it, it seems so natural to him you know, you've got to take care of, of nature because nature takes care of us. You know, it's just seemed in, incredible that people didn't see what he saw. But he was a, he was a, a great oh, conveyor of that personal passion. You yeah. could feel the electricity around him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he buzzed. <laughs> and I, I, oh. I, I, think, I think for him it was so powerful too because it wasn't always... Uh, I'm fascinated with nature because nature uh, supports us or because nature is important. It was just fascination. It was just a passion for knowing yeah. oh. about the ocean and the yeah. world around him. He, Every had to, he had to answer questions. You know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you thought about. I don't know if you thought about it, Mimi, but I think some some shorter version of the film, or in some way, shape, or form, that could be shared with young people around the world. Um, you know, ocean literacy is what we call it, and there's just not enough of it in our school system to teach people about the ocean. But you know, an excerpt from the film about one person's enthusiasm and love for the ocean, and like you said, it's just simple exploration, and I think that would go a long way, and I think that would be really, really yes. wonderful. We're hoping to do that. Yeah. Yeah, and, and if you could just share, you and I were on a um, we were on an interview the other day, and you shared the story of the two kids in Australia. Can you just tell us? Yes, that was so. I mean, it just oh, I get goosebumps. I had a text from this boy in Australia, um, a boy, young man. I think he's sixteen, and he said, "I just have to tell you that I watched the film, and then I watched the film again." He said, I've just watched it for the third time, I think in one day or two days. And he said, I, my best friend and I are, um, as soon as it's summer, you know, it's Australia, so they're spring, coming up spring. Um, he said, we are going down to make an, a film about the ocean. I don't care what it's like. I just know what Mike has inspired me to want to do that. And I just thought, that's it. I mean, that's, that's it. kind of why we made the film, you know, if just a couple of kids and let's hope that's exponential a lot more kids but can do that then we've done our job 
-hmm. And so Anna, you're right. I, I um, we're talking about a small, a shorter version for schools. Yeah, I think that's fantastic because you know we do a middle school and high school program with our kids um, at the festival where we bring in you know, the kids for free, over 1,500 kids from the Bay Area, middle school and high school. And half of these kids say they may not have been into the ocean, they have not even been near the ocean. And they come away just inspired. And when the pandemic hit in March, we made them all virtual. And we shared them with all the teachers and they shared them with the kids. And what we found was that the kids ended up watching them at home with their mom and dad. And so we, the, the impact was just tremendous. And, and so um, what you can do with film is, is very powerful. And, uh, and we need to reach those young kids so they understand what lies you know, in the future. And then it's up to them to start taking care of it. Look, it, you know, it, it works. When the astronauts took that image mm -hmm. of Earth from space, you know, very few people were involved with being there. Those of us who are privileged to go underwater have an obligation to share the view, just as astronauts shared the view. What if they didn't? What if they hadn't shared the view? <laughs> what if we are reluctant to, sh to, to, to tell people what we know and love and what, why it matters? We really have to do this. This part of the universe rocks. We just <laughs> nothing like it anywhere else. And if if we can just, I mean, that's that's what Mike was so good at doing. You got to see this. Look at this. This is spectacular. And he he felt it right to the tips of his flippers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So can I ask uh, Mimi a yeah, question? Go for it, please. please, please. <laughs> so Mimi, um, I watched the film again and I, I just wanted to say, you know, um, I, I know that we, we conferred a, a bit back and forth, uh, Gracie and I with you on various cuts. And I just think you did a, an amazing job uh, with the film and getting a, the, the balance right. And um, obviously for personal reasons, I'm really affected w w when I watch it but also just from a filmmaking point of view, it's just a, a beautiful job. And, and I, I know that you struggled along the way making the film, and I want maybe you to talk a little bit about it, with how much of your personal story you wanted in there versus just telling Mike's story and his love of the ocean and his message. Because I know we encourage you, you know, to put as much of your, so can you talk a little bit about how you arrived at the balance that you have? Well, yeah, it was very hard, but thank you very much for saying those things. I, that means so much to me because you guys knew him as well as anyone. And so it means a lot to have your um, blessing. And I think, you know, I could have told the story obviously just of his life, but for me, I saw a sort of parallel story, um, which is exploring the deep, obviously, which was Mike's big passion, exploring the deep ocean. But for me, having been left suddenly by his death and recognizing that there was this deep part of our relationship that I felt we hadn't explored as much as I wished we had. And I, I thought, you know, maybe in some way, if that can inspire someone to explore the deep ocean, mm -hmm. uh, obviously, but also to explore their relationships with each other and those they love the most, because we don't wanna leave the ocean unexplored and have it disappear. We don't wanna leave our most important relationships unexplored when we leave each other. So I felt there are these kind of two tandem stories or um, stories in tandem. And that allowed me, I think, to bring myself in a little bit. I, I just didn't wanna, I don't know, there had to be a reason. I didn't, and, and even as it was, I it was awkward, you know, <laughs> it's hard. Um, but if I felt that it's moved the story forward, then I could justify it to myself. And I felt really strongly that, you know, those conversations that we have with each other that are hard and we avoid, mm -hmm. don't avoid them, you know, have them because you don't want to be left with the sadness. And similarly, we have to have these conversations about the ocean because it's it's disappearing faster than we can even recognize. 
-hmm. And so I just saw those two parallel storylines. Mm -hmm. And thank you for sharing that, um, Mimi. I think you're right. And, and I'm so glad you pointed that out. Um, and it also truly felt like a love story. I felt like I was watching just an amazing love story between two people and it was, um, it was touching in that sense. And I think um, I'm gonna encourage people to look at it in what you just said is, you know, exploring the ocean, but exploring our relationships with each other and not leaving anything out there. Um, I do wanna switch over real quickly to a question from the audience um, and just kind of bring it back to, where we are today and, and kind of what we can do. Um, I have an, a question from Sebastian in um, Utah. And his, he says the latest IPCC report, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, tells us that all coral reefs are at risk of being damaged or completely destroyed within 20 years. Um, and so Sylvia, through your working with Mike and your own expeditions, how, do you, how did you experience the effects of climate change and what would you tell our audiences about the urgency of addressing climate change since it is happening so quickly and so rapidly? There are things that we could and should be doing that we're not in terms of carbon capture and sequestration. We know what to do, it's a matter of doing it. With respect to the ocean, the more that we can embrace with care, keep those systems intact, the better chance we'll have of having resilience in the face of change. The other part with the ocean, well, it all ties together, but we talk about with climate, it, if we plant trees, if we keep trees intact, if we don't cut the trees, that helps. In the ocean, we're clear cutting the fish and the other creatures on a, an industrial scale. This is not about people feeding families or communities, but the large scale extraction of ocean wildlife. And we're talking on the order of 100 million tons a year plus destruction of habitats, destruction of the carbon capture, capturing systems. It, it Somehow it's not on in the climate discussions as much as it should be, because it is so obvious when you think every fish, like every tree, is a carbon-based unit, so are we. If you leave them in the ocean, it, the carbon stays in the ocean, and it maintains the integrity of the systems that got us to this happy place that we've experienced throughout the course of human civilization. It's taken four and a half billion years to get us here and about four and a half decades to significantly unravel the very systems that in a universe that's really unfriendly, we've got a planet that works in our favor. Take care of it. That's what I think Mike would be saying. You gotta take care of every coral reef that's in good shape because it's our best defense system. Don't kill the fish. <laughs> fish are more important alive swimming in the ocean than swimming on our plates mm -hmm. in lemon slices and butter. <laughs> <laughs> it's wildlife, it's wildlife. Think mm -hmm. of it that way. And plus all these other things that we, the fossil fuels, if we can just realize, thank you fossil fuels that got us to this great place of understanding travel and all that, but we've got to come up with alternatives. The best gift that fossil fuels have given us is knowing we have to change. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. Thank you for that, Sylvia. And we're, we're kind of at the top of the hour here. Um, like I said, it goes so fast. fast. <laughs> Went by super fast. Um, do you guys have any final thoughts that you'd like to share, um, Mimi and Paul? And Paul, I, I really would like to bring it back sometimes when we talk to filmmakers. What advice would you give to someone who is thinking about becoming a filmmaker, whether it's in the ocean or just a, a, as a career? And then Mimi will give you the final, final word here. Was that, was that a question for me? Yeah, what would you tell a young person who's thinking about going into filmmaking? I, I would uh, tell them uh, the same thing uh, I, I would uh, 
told a young person years ago, uh, go out and if that's your passion, uh, you must do it and, and get a camera, any kind of camera. It's much easier nowadays. Uh, when we were, uh, Mike and I were shooting and, and Mimi and I, we were uh, working, we had to shoot 16 millimeter film to make these films. Now, you know, you can shoot with an iPhone. It's not the best image in the world, but it's possible. So now the technology is readily available. Learn, learn whatever technology it is. It's just a tool like a paintbrush and express yourself and make films. Start making little short films, showing them to people, get a little reel together of your own uh, personal films that you made on your own dime. That's, and start showing it to professionals. That, and, and, and the other thing I would recommend is it's the same thing as it used to be. It's sort of like a, 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 an apprenticeship program. You really want to learn how uh, a film crew operates, uh, contact somebody whose work you love and offer your help as an intern mm -hmm. and work for nothing at first mm -hmm. and learn it that way. And eventually you'll, you'll become so valuable they have to pay you. So. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, Mimi, any, any final thoughts? Well, I think that, you know, Going back to Mike, I think he would be saying, just jump in, just look around and you will be awestruck by what you see. And I think to those people who maybe live too far to jump in, um, you know, watch these films that Anna, you're doing such an amazing job getting so many films out to so many people around the world. Look at those, watch those, understand from the work that Sylvia is doing and you know, that the ocean fuels our very existence. I mean, it covers 70% of the planet. We've explored, what, 5%, maybe 10 on a good day? Um, that it is, it is critical to our existence that we put more energy into exploring and understanding more. Um, so I would just say, be curious. I mean, Mike was so curious, you know? Mm -hmm. He just wanted to know more about everything and everyone, mm -hmm. so yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's well said. I think Mike was just, like you said, curious and, and explored and just so enthusiastic and, and so excited by what he found. And I think that just kept fueling him to want to know more and find out more. So thank you for that. Sylvia, thank you. Any, any more words for us? Any, any parting words and anything you would want to say? I just want to salute my fellow panelists for... Huh. Yeah, the gift of sharing your your love of of Mike and what he represented, what he still represents. That man packed so much into the life that he had. I mean, he lived twenty lifetimes, if you will. He he was so intense, and so are you. You know, you've got the gift of. Of, of getting in there and making things happen. <laughs> Boredom, what's that? <laughs> yeah, how could you be bored in this world? <laughs> no reason to be bored whatsoever. Yeah. Um, well, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you to those who joined us live. And um, I highly encourage you to watch the film. Thank you, Mimi, for such a fantastic film. Um, thank you, Paul, yes. for your insight. And thank you, Sylvia, for joining us today and for inspiring us all. And thank you, Mike. I hope you're looking down on us and, and, and pleased with, with our conversation and, and, and the number of people who get to see this amazing film that you're- I think loving. he's looking up. Looking up. <laughs> yes, I would agree. There you go. That's a good one. I like that, Sylvia. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, we're going to turn the live stream off, but let's stick around for a minute. And uh, thank you. Thank you.